Good morning. It is great for you to see me. And hopefully uh, soon I will be able to see you. Um, we'll have information about that later. Um, but today is the Lord's Day. Today is the day that he has given to us that we might gather even if while scattered, uh, we would gather together to worship him. So let's go as we go to God's word and hear this call to worship. Let me invite you to stand for our call to worship from Psalm number 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that he is the Lord, that he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. The Lord has called us to worship him. So let us sing together hymn number 101, Come Thou Almighty King. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, who from all eternity has searched us out that we might know you, receive us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we may be his disciples, that we might hear his word, that we might celebrate his mighty acts of redemption. Pour out your Holy Spirit that we would worship you in spirit and in truth that though we cannot see you, we might know you in our hearts, that your truth would be indwelling, that it would be a fountain of living water welling up to eternal life. To you, O gracious Father, enthroned above, and to the Son incarnate, and to the Spirit dwelling within our hearts, be all glory now and again and forevermore. Amen. This morning, as we gather together, even if virtually, to worship our great God, we affirm our faith using the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question and answer number 25. The Catechism continues to work through the offices that Christ executes, 
we come to the second of these offices. So Christian, I ask you, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ executes the office of a priest in his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and to reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We now have the great privilege to come before our great Father, knowing that we are sinful, knowing that we do not deserve his grace, but knowing that through Christ he offers it, and that we can come offering up our prayers of confession to him, knowing that through Christ he will hear and he will forgive. Let me invite you to join with me as we pray together our prayer of confession taken from 1 Kings chapter 8. Let us pray together. Lord God, we have sinned and done wrong. We have committed wickedness. Here in heaven, your dwelling place, our prayer and our supplication, and maintain our cause. Forgive your people who have sinned against you in all our transgressions which we have transgressed against you. Grant us compassion. For you separated us from all the peoples of the earth to be your inheritance. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved, hear these words of assurance of pardon that come from the prophet Micah. Micah writes, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over our transgression? For the remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in his steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all of our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Beloved, hear this good news that if you have confessed your sins and trust in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then you are forgiven. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 22. As we continue to see God's faithfulness poured out towards his uh, child, Abraham, who is our covenantal father. Um, We come to this uh, amazing passage in chapter 22. We affirmed our faith earlier, talking about the priesthood of Christ and how Christ has become that sacrifice for us. Here we see in Genesis chapter 22, in which God provides a sacrificial lamb for Isaac. I invite you to give your attention to the reading of God's word in Genesis chapter 22. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes And saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father, And he said, Here I am, my son. 
He said, Behold, the, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba and Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now after these things it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your son Nahor, Uz his firstborn, firstborn, Buzz his brother, Kimuel the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Reumah, bore Teba, Geham, Tehash, and Ma'akah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's now respond to the reading of God's word. Stand together and we'll sing of God's praises, singing hymn number 131, Children of the Heavenly Father. Let's sing together.
Amen. You may be seated. We now have an opportunity to go to our great Lord in prayer, um, offering up to him um, our prayers of intercession, asking him to intercede on our behalf in this world. So this morning we will be using Psalm number 105 as the pattern for our prayer. 105 is a a psalm that really recounts all that God has done for his people as he redeemed them out of the slavery in the land of Egypt and as he provided for them. Um, We need this same redemption today. And so as we recount God's faithfulness in the past, we know he will continue to be faithful in the present and in the future. So let's now go to the Lord in prayer. Psalm 105. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. Father, we do praise your name for you are great. We sing your praises for you are holy. We declare your praises to all the nations for you are the Lord God Almighty. Sing praises to him, sing praises, tell of all his wondrous works. Father, you have done good to us, and we would respond by telling others about it. We are but needy beggars who have found food everlasting, and may we go and tell all the other needy beggars where they may find this magnificent feast. You are our covenant God. You have loved us with a steadfast love, and you have sustained your people through every trial. Indeed, you have ordained every trial, because through our struggles, through our pain, you have shown yourself to be even more glorious, even more satisfying. You have revealed yourself more clearly through our pain, and through our trials, and through our struggles. And so, Lord, for these, we give you thanks. Lord, we remember the wondrous works that you have done. We remember and we proclaim that you are the creator God. You have made all things out of nothing simply by the word of your power. You spoke into existence, out of nothingness, all that there is. All things owe their very existence to you, for you are the creator and we are the creation. O Lord, we remember your miracles. We recall and we celebrate the inbreaking of your kingdom into this fallen world. We celebrate and remember that you have brought life where there was death that you parted the waters to bring us redemption, that you have brought victory where there was defeat, that you have brought health and wholeness where there was illness and brokenness. You have turned the heart of stone into a heart of flesh. We remember your miracles. And Lord, we remember your judgments. You have condemned all sin. You will judge and you will punish and you will destroy all sin. And Lord, in the midst of a fallen world, we cling to this promise. We are not unaware that apart from your grace, we deserve your judgment. For we know that we are sinners. But you have redeemed your people who have repented of their sin and who have turned to Christ by faith. But Lord, may your judgment and your justice and your righteousness flow down upon the guilty, upon the unrighteous, and upon the wicked. Lord, we pray for your judgment to come upon those who would snuff out the life of the vulnerable and the weak. We pray for repentance, but if not, 
we pray for your righteous judgment to come, that it may come upon the abortionist, that it would come upon the racist, that it would come upon the murderer and upon the thief, upon the one who would use his authority and his power to oppress and abuse the innocent. Lord, we know that this nation is hurting and broken and divided. And we ask that you would bring healing through the balm of your gospel. Give us hope that wickedness and evil will be judged. Father, we thank you for your covenant promises. You have steadfastly loved your people from generation to generation. You have given us the record of your faithfulness that we might be encouraged and strengthened. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant that he made with Abraham, his sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed to Jacob as a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as your portion for an inheritance. When they were few in number, of little account, and sojourners in it, wandering from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another people, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked kings on their account, saying, Touch not my anointed ones, do my prophets no harm. When he summoned a famine on the land and broke all supply of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave, His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron until what he had said came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Then Israel came to Egypt. Jacob sojourned in the land of Ham. And the Lord made his people very fruitful and made them stronger than their foes. He turned their hearts to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. He sent Moses, his servant, and Aaron, whom he had chosen. They performed signs among them and miracles in the land of Ham. He sent darkness and made the land dark. They did not rebel against his words. He turned their waters into blood and caused their fish to die. Their land swarmed with frogs, even in the chambers of their kings. He spoke, and there came swarms of flies and gnats throughout their country. He gave them hail for rain and fiery lightning bolts through their land. He struck down their vines and fig trees, shattered the trees of their country. He spoke, and the locusts came, young locusts without number, which devoured all the vegetation in their land and ate up the fruit of their ground. He struck down all the firstborn in their land, the firstfruits of their strength. Then he brought out Israel with silver and gold. There was none among his tribes who stumbled. Egypt was glad when they departed, for dread of them had fallen upon it. He spread a cloud for a covering and fire to give them light by night. They asked, and he brought quail, and he gave them bread from heaven in abundance. He opened the rock and water gushed out. It flowed through the desert like a river, for he remembered his holy promise in Abraham, his servant. So he brought his people out with joy, his chosen ones with singing, and he gave them lands of the nations, and they took possession of the fruit of the people's toil, that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Father, you are good, and your steadfast love endures forever. You have remembered your holy covenantal promise, and you have been faithful. You have always provided for your people. And so we humbly ask you to do that now. As you have provided for your people through famine, by providentially bringing them to Egypt, and then how you rescued them from slavery in Egypt, and then how you led them through the wilderness into the promised land, Lord, we ask that you would provide for us. We are your people, and you are our God. 
Lord, you know our concerns, you know our needs, you know our trials, you know the aches and the longings we have, and we ask that you would hear them now that you would answer them as faithfully as you have answered the needs and the cries of your people in generations past. And Father, we respond by resting in you. We trust and we rely in you. You are our God and we are your people. And we give thanks for your steadfast covenantal love for us. And we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. I invite you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, as we continue on in our look at this chapter, uh, what we come to is uh, a bit of a pause in Paul's discussion of marriage and all the other uh, various circumstances related to marriage, and Paul takes the opportunity to take a step back and to consider the broader principle that underlies the advice that he is giving here in chapter 7. So we'll be looking at uh, verses 17 to 24 this morning, so I invite you to give your attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 17. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word, and we thank you that our identity in Christ is enough. We do pray that you would help us to have a contentment with those ways in which you have assigned our lives and how you have called us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had that itch to make a change, maybe to freshen things up? Particularly as the weather gets warmer, we start to feel that, that idea. We just need to freshen things up a little bit. Some of you might not ever have that itch, but maybe others have. And, and maybe uh, you want to paint your walls a different color now, just to freshen things up. Maybe you want to change the style of your wardrobe or the length of your beard if you can grow one. Which I can't. That's why I'm always clean shaven. Many of these changes, these desires to have a change, are innocent enough, right? It doesn't really matter what you do with the length of your beard. Or maybe it does. I wouldn't know. But sometimes, sometimes, you might want to make that change because there's some motivation behind there. You think you might be better, just, just more holy, more closer to God. If I do this change, maybe if I just do this, then things will really be the way they should be. If you've ever felt that pull, a desire to make this change in your worldly circumstances, either to to be closer to God or to, to really be fulfilled in your life, then this text is speaking a word to you. This text that Paul gives to us this morning speaks to us about the very real problem with desiring and seeking after worldly change for the sake of spiritual gain. 
As Paul has discussed the marital status in many different ways in the prior sections, and actually he'll continue to do that uh, after this little uh, 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 digression, uh, he will, he, now he decides to discuss the general principle that underlies why he is saying what he's saying in this chapter. In sum, to think that if I can make a change in my worldly circumstances, to be a better Christian is a fool's errand. What our text is pointing us to is the surpassing value of our identity in Jesus Christ, irrespective of the life situation that you find yourself in when you are called by God out of darkness and into his marvelous light. This means that our perspective of change in our lives largely depends on our motivations for that change. And so to summarize Paul's whole argument in these verses, it's change isn't bad, but bad change is bad. It's pretty simple, but I think it encapsulates what Paul is trying to say here. Change isn't bad. Bad change is bad. Now, Paul's main point is, is very simple in this text, and it's, it's quite straightforward. He repeats it three times in verses 17, 20, and 24. What he says is that in whatever situation God has effectually called you, that out of darkness and into light calling, is a sufficient situation for you to be faithful to God as you walk with him. Whatever, whatever life situation, the worldly circumstances that you find yourself in when you are converted are sufficient for you to be a godly Christian. And to seek worldly change for the sake of spiritual gain is to imply that certain life situations are inferior to others. But more than that, it also belies a measure of discontent. A discontentment that should not take residence in the heart of a follower of Christ. And so Paul is addressing this idea and the broad uh, principle of it. I mean, that was the point that, that Paul has been making about marriage. Because there were some in the Corinthian church who were saying, well, if only I was married, or if only I was unmarried, then I would be super spiritual. But Paul's point is remain as God has called you. If you were uh, married when he called you, when he converted you, remain. If you're unmarried, do the same. And so in verses 17 and 20 and 24, with largely the same language, he makes this point. Remain as you were called, because it doesn't matter what your worldly circumstances are. You can be faithful to God in them. Now, to support his point, Paul is going to use two, raise two ideas, uh, first one in verses 18 and 19, the second one in verses 21 to 23, to, to bolster this idea that change isn't bad, but bad change is bad, and, and, and the the, the underlying critique of the Corinthian church is that you're, you're trying to change for bad reasons, so stop it. Be content in the situation that God has called you. So as we look at this text, I'm going to break it down into those two parts of the supporting ideas. We're going to look at verses 18 and 19, and we're going to see this, this principle that, that Paul lays out that the grass isn't greener on the other side of the fence. And then we'll look at verses 21 and 23, and we'll see that Paul will make an argument you can't stake your hopes and your dreams in worldly circumstances. So those are two ideas. And let's get started by looking at our first idea that Paul lays out to support his, his point, that the grass isn't greener. Or to use a little bit more words to say the same thing, there's no reason to make a change in your social situation because that is of no consequence. There's no reason to make a change in your social situation because your social situation is of no consequence consequence. Now this idea begins in verse 18, so take a look at that now. Let's see what Paul has to say. He says, was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Now Paul here is addressing that Jew-Greek paradigm. He's discouraging either group from making a change to become like the other. And so he's saying, Jews, 
do not try to cover up the marks of circumcision. And Greeks don't try to uh, add the marks of circumcision. See, Paul's directive here, whether it's, it's to a specific situation in Corinth or just the general idea, is that there might be a desire to gain something from either covering up your social identity or from creating a different one or moving to a different social identity. Either way, this, this idea of either trying to hide or to gain from a social identity is a fool's errand. So we need to see that the problem here, the problem seems to be a, a, a thinking that if only I were X, then I'd be fulfilled. I'd be super spiritual. If only I were circumcised, I'd be a full Christian. If only I were uncircumcised, I wouldn't have to hide that stigma anymore. But there's at least two flaws with this line of thinking that Paul is, is laying out and, and critiquing here. First of all, implicit in what Paul is saying here is that such thinking is denying the value of diversity. As if to say that if to be a true Christian, everyone must be a Jew, or to be a true Christian, everyone must be a Greek, is to deny the value of diversity. Now, Pastor Donnie has discussed this point a few weeks ago, and so I'm not going to press it now. All I'll have to say here is that diversity is not a problem that needs to be eliminated. Pastor Donnie mentioned uh, the glorious visions that John has in the book of Revelation, and they very much include diversity as something that is beautiful. There's no need to cover up, to try to find uh, a way to, to, to de-emphasize diversity. It's one flaw. One flaw to think that, that it, was, it was a mistake that God has assigned each one of us to a variety of tribes, nations, tongues, and peoples. But there's a second idea that's, that's more to Paul's point uh, in this paragraph, and it's that uh, this, this thinking makes way too much of worldly categories in the first place. This, this idea that if I can change my worldly circumstances to be, more, to, more, to be more spiritual is making way too much of these categories. To say, if only I were Jewish, then I'd be super spiritual is to make far too much about what it means to be Jewish, particularly since what Paul is focusing on here are these outward signs of connections to specific people groups. It's one thing to say if I were circumcised, another thing to say if I were circumcised in heart. And even the Old Testament makes those distinctions and emphasizes uh, the cleanliness of the heart over the outward signs. And so this is why Paul is, is exhorting his audience here not to seek a change in outward signs as if that will finally get you to your super spiritual status. It's foolishness. You think about, just consider your, your, your gold mining and you find this big old hunk of, of gold, but it's unpolished and it's ugly and dirty. And then you look down the river and you just see this, this glinting of fool's gold. You say, well, that's shiny. I'm going to get that, and I'm going to reject what I've got in my hand. It's foolishness just to look at outward appearances and think, well, because that is shiny, that must be what I need. Paul is saying that this is not how you ought to be thinking. And so he discourages this kind of thinking and, and even acting on such a false notion that the grass is greener on the other side. If only I were X. I'd be fulfilled. You need neither adopt nor hide something because you think that by doing so you will become better when it comes to your worldly circumstances. And so in verse 19, uh, Paul reminds us why this is true. Because ultimately, none of these things are important. Look at what he says in verse 19. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision but keeping the commandments of God. What Paul is saying here is that being faithful and obedient as a child of God is what really matters, rather than considering which social group you are identified with. 
So on this point, I need to be very clear here. Paul's general point throughout these verses is going to apply to those things that are not so important in the grand scheme of things. And that's, by the way, whether you think they are or not. To seek change in your worldly circumstances for spiritual gain is a fool's errand. Paul says, focus rather on the things that really matter, on being a faithful child of God. And so what we need to hear from this text is that change isn't bad, but bad change is bad. And we need to see from this is that your walk with God is one of those important things that Paul emphasizes here, where change is not a bad thing. With respect to that, you very much ought to seek change in your life to be more spiritual. You are not to remain as you are in holiness in your walk with God from day one of when you're called by God to the day he brings you into glory. Quite to the contrary, God's will for your life is your sanctification. You've been called out of darkness so that you can walk in more light and be conformed to the image of God's Son, which is a process of change. This text is not a text that we can use to say, well, I'm supposed to remain as I am called and I am sinful and fallen, and so I'm just always going to be like this. I'm going to muddle my way to the end. That's not what Paul is saying when he says, remain as you are called. And those things that are not important, don't give them importance. But in those things that are very important, seek for that change. So we see our point that Paul has is that change isn't bad, but bad change is bad. So let me just wrap up this point by saying this. Alarms should go off in our heads if we begin to think that if only our outward situation were just a little bit different, then I'd be able to walk with God more closely. Paul is clear here. The grass isn't greener on the other side of the fence. Focus on what's important in the situation that God has called you. Fear him and keep his commandments as he has called you. Now again, we saw in verse 20, Paul makes his point again that Christians ought to remain as they were called. And from this restatement of the main point, then Paul moves on to his second supporting idea in verses 21 and 23, through 23. And from these these three verses, we get our second point. Don't stake your hopes and dreams in worldly categories. Don't stake your hopes and dreams in worldly categories. In order to make his point, Paul moves on from the Jew-Greek paradigm, and he moves on to the slave-free paradigm, which is what we see. So look at the beginning of verse 21. Paul says, Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. First of all, we need to acknowledge as we start this this new section in in what Paul is arguing that these are an advancement on what Paul has said before. You see, the slave-free paradigm is different from the Jew-Greek paradigm. It is not true that the grass isn't greener. Double negatives, I know. It's true that the grass is greener if you're a freed man than a slave. That makes sense? There is a disparity between them. So when Paul says, were you a slave when called, do not be concerned about it, we should be surprised at first glance that he's saying such a thing. Because there is a very real economic disparity between a man who is a slave and one who is free. And we have to remember that since God has called many out of many different circumstances in the Corinthian church, when they gathered together, this would have been a reality to them as slave and free, would have been uh, seated in the same uh, uh, gathering and around the same table. So it's worth asking uh, just briefly, uh, what would those economic disparities be between the slave and free uh, where, where we can see how Paul is making a bigger argument than he was before? We we'll have to remember that uh, at least some slaves who were called and converted by God would still have been working for pagans. 
and their lives as slaves still would have been bleak. And yes, they would have uh, had an oppor- many of them would have had an opportunity to buy their freedom or, or be given their freedom, but their present social situation made them quite vulnerable to abuse. And with respect to their work and to their relationships to the world, they were not their own, and they were by no means socially at the same level as the freedmen who sat next to them in the church because they were owned by someone else. So we have to see that difference, the economic disparities that two who were called by God, converted by God, one slave, one free, had very real differences. As a matter of fact, as we continue on in the, in the letter here, we're going to see the differences in social status, wealth, and the standard of living making a difference in the Lord's Supper, for example. There, there were notable differences. Even in the church, you couldn't pass over. This is the economic disparity that, that Paul is the background to what Paul is saying here. Let me just give you a silly illustration to, to hopefully highlight uh, just how apparent these kinds of things would be. I think this works. Consider sitting down at the table with a small child. Maybe you have one. Maybe you've had one. Maybe you can imagine what it's like. You sit down at the table, at the dinner table, with a small child. Now, you're an adult, and this is a small child. Perhaps you can snap your fingers, and the small child can't. Here is a disparity in ability between the two of you. Maybe you can whistle, but the small child can't. Here's a difference in abilities. When I sit down at my dinner table, I can read Greek and Hebrew, but my daughter can't read English. A tremendous disparity in our ability to uh, function. And the reality is, is that these aren't things that can be easily overcome. And here's, the, here's one of the big differences between Jew, Greek, and slave-free. Paul says don't circumcise yourself or, or try to cover the marks of circumcision, which would have been something that was, was fairly easy, if not painful, to do. But here in the slave-free paradigm, this is like the child-adult. A child just can't all of a sudden find a shift in their social situation and be able to do what I can do. There are significant economic disparities that we see. Things that are just not going to change easily. And so Paul is making here an advance on his earlier point. This is a, a, a long way of saying that just don't see these two things as parallel. Even the situation, though, this is the, this is the advancement. Even in a situation when the grass is greener, don't stake your hopes and dreams in worldly categories. So you ha- naturally, the question is going to be, well, why? Well, in short, Paul says that those very real and sometimes apparent economic disparities in the worldly categories between slave and free, as, as a good example, are of no consequence because all believers have ontological parity. It's a big word, but, but I, the idea here is that all believers are on the same level because we're all related to Christ in the same way. Now, to make this point, we need to skip the, the second half of verse 21. We'll, we'll get back to it and look at verses 22 and 23. Here, Paul, as Paul is comparing slave and free, he concludes that in their essence, slave and free are on the same level. That is that they have ontological parity. And you have to ask yourself, well, how is that possible? Well, Paul says that both slave and free are related to Christ in the same way. And to make his point, Paul turns the tables a little bit by playing off that economic disparity that would have been acknowledged and apparent for the Corinthians. So beginning with slaves, he says in verse 22, For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. That is to say that though someone uh, may have bought you, you really are free. You are free from the things that really matter. You are free from sin. You are free from death. You are free from the devil. This is a far more important freedom that you need to see. 
Then to balance the idea, Paul, Paul says, likewise, he who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. That is to say that though someone may seem like the master of his destiny, he is by no means that master. He is a slave of Christ. He is bound to serve the Lord rather than his own desires. And so Paul is pulling these, these, these two sides uh, together in, in verse 23, and he says, You were bought with a price. All of you, slave and free, were bought with a price. The blood of the Lamb. And by him you both serve him and are free from the bondage to sin. In your essence, both the slave and the free are on the same level. In what really matters, the slave and the free are on the same level. And then it is for this reason that Paul tells slaves that their economic situation is of no consequence. He says you need to see it from the right perspective. Though temporal hardships are a reality, what matters far more is your union in Christ. When it comes to the things that really matter, there is no difference between slave and free. So Paul says, striving for a change in status, a worldly status in order to be better with respect to the things that really matter just doesn't make sense. Even if you are a slave, you already have the most precious and imperishable gift that you could ever hope for. So he says, remain as you were called. Yes, even if the grass is greener. Don't stake your hopes and dreams and and improvements in your worldly categories as if that will make you a fuller more fulfilled person. And that's why Paul ends in verse 23 with this sweeping statement, do not become slaves of men. Again, said to both groups here, not about literal slavery, but the idea of a metaphorical uh, slavery to man, Paul's, Paul's moving here to the idea of staking your, your hopes and dreams in worldly categories and therefore becoming slaves to manly things, humanly things. This can't be a concern for, for believers that they would stake everything on worldly categories. All that will happen if you do that is you will slip into slavery and it will not be Christ who is your Lord. Now it is true that some actually did, some freedmen actually did uh, sell themselves into slavery for oftentimes political gain. Uh, But that only reinforces the idea here uh, of what Paul is saying. Even if that isn't on the top of his mind is what what he's talking about here. It reinforces the idea that you cannot stake your hopes and dreams in these worldly categories because you'll only end up being enslaved to the world rather than a servant of Christ. Remain as you were called, Paul says, faithfully living as a servant of Christ and stake your hopes in him and nowhere else. And before we return to verse 21 to end this, let me just say a word about what this might mean for us. This point is highlighting to us the danger of envy and rivalry within the church among fellow believers in Christ. I have to imagine as Paul is writing this letter, this is particularly this section of the letter, he has in mind the divisions of the church that have already been mentioned before. And I imagine he's seeing the potential for these to, to, to play out along class lines. And so his examples are not arbitrary. He uses the slave-free paradigm to remind us that when we backbite and consume one another in our envy and our rivalry because of worldly matters, we are only becoming slaves of the world. There's no room in the church for behavior that will sour relationships between fellow believers simply because the worldly categories are different between us. We need to hear Paul's words carefully. Whatever outward circumstances and whatever outward differences there are between fellow believers, and there are plenty, there is still 
parity in what really matters, in our relationship to Christ. So this is a call for us all to seek contentment with respect to worldly categories. A caution against staking our hopes and dreams in these worldly categories. So, so far in, in the second point, we've been laying out the whole idea that bad change is bad. Bad change is bad, but, but that's not all of what Paul has to say. Re- return back to the second half of verse 21, and we'll see that change isn't always bad. And Paul, this is what Paul says. It's, a, it's parentheses, parentheses in, in the uh, ESV. He says, but if you can gain your freedom, speaking to the slaves, avail yourself of the opportunity. Quite explicitly, uh, Paul is is laying forth an exception to his general rule to remain as you are called. As he speaks to these slaves, he says that if you have that opportunity given to you of uh, this idea of manumission, of being able to uh, come out from the yoke of man, then yes, make the most of that opportunity. As it is given to you, don't think that when I say remain as you were called, that means don't take the opportunities that God gives to you since, you know, he is the one who is directing the course of all history. You shouldn't stake your hopes and dreams in worldly categories, but if worldly categories change, there's nothing wrong with that. So long as your motivations are rightly ordered. I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on this point. I don't think we as Americans are really uh, concerned, overly concerned about not making change. I think we are too quick to make change. Yes, we need to see the nuance and the very important qualification that Paul is making about what it means to remain as you are called. But, But by and large, what we need to do first is ask the question, why do I want to seek change in my worldly situation? Is it because I think that this is the only way that I will be more fulfilled. And if that's true, then, then see what Paul has to say here, that, that bad change is bad. Don't do it. Be content in the situation where God converted you. Nevertheless, let me just say this about what Paul has to say at the end of verse 21. If you have an opportunity for advancement at work, it's not as though Paul is saying, remain as you were called as a call to apathy. I'm just going to slide along in this world. That's not what he says. Maybe, and and perhaps even you should, take that opportunity so long as it is not your Savior. Maybe, Maybe no one in your family has ever gone to college and you have the opportunity to do it. Don't let this be the text that says, well, no, I'll just continue what everyone else has done so I can remain as I was called. No, that's not what Paul is saying. Take it so long as you remember that education is not your Savior. This is what Paul's argument here is. Don't be hamstrung by your present circumstances to pursue God as God directs your life. Only make sure that as you pursue God, your motivations are rightly ordered. Change isn't bad. It's bad change that's bad. That's what Paul's saying here. The emphasis for the Corinthian church, and I think for us, ought to be on that bad change is bad side. But it's not excluding change. Not all change is bad. So we need to primarily acknowledge the very real problem with worldly change for the sake of spiritual gain. We need to consider deeply when when we're contemplating a change in our worldly status, whether we should approach it or, or, or that we should approach it as a secondary matter, not as a primary matter. Our primary identity is in Christ And all flows from there. There's no need to change your worldly status for spiritual gain. For God has provided everything that you need, wherever you are, to live a faithful life to him. Change isn't bad. Bad change is bad. Consider your identity in Christ and live faithfully however he has called you. You might bring glory to him in that situation. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that you call us all out of darkness in many different ways. We thank you, O God, that you have provided such tremendous diversity in your church and gifting uh, to your church 
I pray that we would uh, value this, that we would uh, value our identity in Christ and seek contentment as you have called us. Pray, O oh God, that you would give us the grace to do so. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing our hymn of response, hymn 691, It Is Well With My Soul.
And beloved, receive now this benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. A few announcements for us all. First of all, I invite you to tune in for the evening service, the evening uh, cap, night cap on our Lord's Day as Pastor Donnie will be uh, preaching through uh, 2 John all in one homily. It will be tremendous, so make sure that you tune in for it. As a reminder, next week, we, we Lord willing, will be meeting in person. And uh, Pastor Donnie, on behalf of the session, had sent out a letter that is now posted on the website. So if you didn't see it, now you have an opportunity to read it again, or for the first time. Another letter will be sent out uh, this week, providing a few more details and frequently asked questions. Of course, if you do have questions, please reach out to us, and we'd be happy to uh, answer those questions uh, for you and to uh, either encourage you or, or help you through your decision making. A, a few other announcements. The women's uh, Bible study, uh, that group is going to start back on June 9th, uh, but you need to order the book. It's a book by Melissa Kruger uh, entitled In All Things uh, on uh, Philippians, I believe. Uh, you can uh, reach out to us or, or Audrey uh, if you need to find more information about that. Finally, for Sunday school on Wednesday night, uh, the topic will be wind. So, as we've mentioned, earth, wind, and fire, we're very nearly there. Wind this week. Think about it. Those are all the announcements that we have, so uh, be well until we see you again.